Let's start with some stats. At least one in ten have lung disease. And 14% of people each year die of lung disease. It is the third biggest health burden. And lung cancer being the biggest killer, a cancer killer, more than breast, prostate and ovarian combined. The most common reason for people to seek medical consultation is the cost that won't go away. Only 10% of Australians get the flu each year and there are over 30 different rare lung diseases. And this in despite the fact that most people when surveyed reported at least one symptom of risk factors associated with lung disease. In Australia, poor lung health is affecting millions of Australians at any one time. Importantly and worryingly, the Lung Foundation is that for many of these people, they will be living with ignoring symptoms of poor lung health, such as breathlessness and a cough. Over half of Australians never think about lung health. When you think about lung disease, what comes to mind? Lung cancer, asthma, in fact, there are dozens and dozens of lung diseases affecting Australians. And you don't have to have a history of smoking to get lung diseases. COPD in Australia, one in seven over 40 have COPD. Half of people with COPD have not received a diagnosis, estimating to be over 400,000 people undiagnosed. It is the second leading cause of avoidable admissions to hospitals and the prevalence growing faster among women. Approximately 20% of adult Aboriginal Australians have higher prevalence in remote areas. And mortality and mobility rates are more than five times the national average for Australian Aboriginals. Early diagnosis and intervention of evidence-based um, management can actually slow the disease progression down, improve symptoms, keep people out of hospital and actually reduce the burden on patient care and community. So COPD is an umbrella term of a group of obstructive airway disorders characterized by airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. These include chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and small airway disease and chronic asthma. The clinical features and pathophysiology of COPD can overlap with chronic bronchitis, emphysema and asthma. The interrelationship of these conditions with airflow obstruction and COPD are illustrated on this, this um, Vino diagram, as you can see here. So some people actually will have one of the disease, diseases, or they could have two of the diseases, or actually have all three. Airflow obstruction in COPD is not highly variable and largely irreversible, and is due to combined combination of airway and parasthenal damage. COPD is defined as a preventable and treatable disease. It's associated with significant extra pulmonary consequences that may contribute to severity. Airflow limitation is usually progressive and an abnormal inflammatory response of the lung to noxious particles. In Australia, in Australia, COPD is mainly caused by cigarette smoking. About 20 to 30 percent of causes are caused by inhaled particles through other causes such as dust and fumes from industrial environments. Genetic factors also play a role, like alpha-1 antitrypsin. The ventilation and defect in COPD, this diagram shows a normal airway, as seen here, and a COPD airway, which is obstructive and elastic recall has been damaged in the alveoli, which causes difficulty to get the air out quickly. The International Primary Care Respiratory Group Women by Dr. Antonia Ital, 2012, Women and Respiratory Disease, the Sex and Gender Perspective, demonstrated that there are gender differences between the susceptible 
disability to Lyme disease between men and women. Women should be greater risk because of the following. How does physiology different? Female hormones play a big part on lung development in size in women. Regulations of receptors and biomedical um, pathways and on airway hyper responsiveness and sorry, responsiveness, can't say the word, okay. <laughs> and inflammation. The, the difference appears to increase susceptibility in post-pubescent girls and women up to asthma, COPD and lung cancer. The latest evidence shows women are more likely to develop the bronchitic COPD phenotype rather than emphysema is wrong. Environmental difference to women means we are exposed more to biomass fuels using the cooking and in particular occupational and chemical triggers such as working in cotton factories for example. It is more fashionable to, at present for women to smoke and women use it for waste and mood control. However, evidence shows we have greater loss of lung function in females than male smokers. Also, we are more susceptible to the effects of tobacco in lung disease, such as progression of COPD and lung cancer. Women have more relapses and quitting and higher level of addiction to nicotine dependence and the withdrawal symptoms in men. Another difference for women is that we have different symptoms to men with the osteoporosis and depression that men actually suffer from. Throughout this talk, we will highlight some practical tips in relation to the management of women with lung disease. When you're thinking of COPD, if at all, you may conjure up an image such as an elderly, frail gentleman. But some of the real faces of COPD might actually surprise you. This is Mick, who's 49. This is Heather, who's 65. And this is Ray, who's 54. And this is Sue, who's only 37. Women are more likely to be diagnosed with asthma. In Australia, we know that three out of five people report of symptoms of lung disease, but most feel their lungs are fine. Lung Foundation developed a simple lung health checklist. It takes two minutes to complete, as shown on this next slide. Questions to ask would be, do you have new ongoing change in your cough? Do you cough at mucus, phlegm or blood? Do you get out of breath more easily than others your age? Do you experience chest tightness or wheeze? Do you have frequent chest infections? Do you experience chest pain, fatigue or sudden weight loss? Do you have a history of smoking? Do you have a history of working in industrial environments? So, women may not experience typical COPD symptoms Reassessing new diagnosis of asthma in older women, it is really a mixed disease or COPD, so we really need to define that. Consider COPD in all women with a smoking history or chronic biomass fuel use, exposure and any chronic respiratory symptoms. So biomass is an energy that is derived from five quite, five quite distinctive energy sources. Garbage, wood, waste, landfill gases, and alcohol fuels. Most biomass still relies on incineration or burning, and to this end, forest residues such as dead trees, branches, and tree stumps. Yard clippings, wood chips, and garbage are often used. Biomass nowadays tend to also include plant or animal matter used for the production of fibres or chemicals and may also include biogradable waste that can be burnt as fuel. We thought we would present some case studies and these, these people would like to share their experiences. In April 3, 2014, this is called a light smoker's tale. 
Mary, who's now age 75, lives in Oak Flat, New South Wales. Although only a light smoker for 20 years, she acquired COPD with a dissociated limitation to opt in lifestyle. My occupation was a telephonist at Wollongong Telephone Exchange for several years. I've been married for 53 years to my husband, Keith. I smoked lightly for approximately 20 years from the age of 16. Tried all types of stop smoking devices, did the Vianto course several years ago, and finally gave up smoking with the help of hypnosis in 1972 when they hit the therapy. My health was badly affected, for example, sitting outside on the steps in the early hours of the morning to help with my breathlessness. I'm not sure when I was diagnosed with COPD, but it would have been several years ago. My GP has been very helpful. So sending me to a lung specialist, then to the Pumi Rehab Center at Shell Harbor Hospital, where we are in the capable hands of a physiotherapist who really cares for us. I am now under the regular care of a doctor at the hospital. With the walking and exercising, I'm starting to feel much better. I'm still playing lawn bowls, but realize my limitations. When climbing stairs or walking up a slight incline, I hope this information has got some help to you. Now, Victoria was diagnosed in 2009 with a routine chest x-ray before a teacher exchange showed a shadow on the lung, first miracle, not normally picked up at this stage. She was 29 and never smoked. Two weeks later, she had surgery to move the affected lung. She started 16 rounds of chemotherapy for lung cancer. Second miracle, Victoria and her husband, Luke, got pregnant two years following her diagnosis, despite warning that chemo would have played havoc with her fertility. Victoria's physician determined that one lung would be sufficient for mother and baby until 36 weeks. Caesarean was arranged. Third miracle is Archie. Victoria is now almost five years cancer-free and Archie almost won. This diagram depicts the cycle of inactivity that people with lung disease often get into, which will cause more infection and hospital admissions. As people with lung disease get more breathless when they're active, they start to rely on others to do things for them and lose some independence. This causes lack of confidence and people will then reduce their activity to the minimum, which in return causes muscle weakness, loss of muscle strength and heart function. Often people will decline in their physical fitness and become socially isolated as they feel they cannot do what they used to be able to do. Shortness of breath increases due to this, but also due to anxiety and depression, which has a major impact on, on quality of life. Lung disease has a major impact on patients resulting in a cycle of inactivity leading to increased disability. Exercise is a key activity in reversing this cycle. So we'll go on to the diagnosis of CRPD and how important the spirometry is. CRPD cannot be accurately diagnosed by clinical history and examination alone nor by chest x-ray. Spirometry is the most standardized and reproducible way of assessing airflow limitation to make an accurate diagnosis of COPD. Symptom-based diagnosis of COPD in primary care is unreliable, especially if patients are overweight. So diagnostic spirometry is essential to avoid inappropriate management. Spirometry is the measuring of breath. This diagnostic test measures the amount or volume and or speed, which is the flow, of air that can be inhaled and exhaled. Irreversible airflow obstruction is defined as the 
reduced FEV1, which means false expiratory volume in one second, and a reduced FEV1 over FEC ratio, which is the force vital um, capacity. And this is measured after administration of bronchi dilator. A spirometry test measures force expiratory volume in one second and how much air you can breathe in and out. So this is the diagnostic spirometry as you can see from here. So the CMD is diagnosed as, you, as we just said by spirometry. This graph shows a normal spirometry flow and volume. And this shows a COVD flow and volume as you can see it's vastly reduced. So an FE1, FEC ratio below 0.17 and FE1 below 80% is, is the diagnosis. COPD X guidelines for Australian and New Zealand identify three stages of the condition with symptoms increasing in severity of lung function decline. Just to let you know, the National Asthma Council do provide spirometry courses and they have just recently done a research in 2004 which showed that 64% of Australian um, practices had a spirometer but actually had um, no proper training, um, the spirometer was not calibrated and, and of course the other issues that we have in general practice is increased cost of longer consultations for patients and no medical rebate. Medicare rebates without reversibility testing. Now just to go back to this diagram, it shows um, the severity of CFD. So this is a person with mild CFD and the FEV1 in the post bronchodilator, which is the fourth expiratory volume in one second, is measured between 60 and 80% of predicted values. And predicted values are done from the age, the sex and the gender. They will actually have very few symptoms affecting their quality of life. And then you've got someone with moderate um, COPD as seen on the diagram and it's um, lung function in the FEV1 is between 40 and 59% of predicted. And they will have increased dyspnea, breathlessness, walking on the flat and increased limitation of daily activity. Now the severe COPD is below 40% of predicted and they are very breathless and um, on minimal exertion and they are vastly reducing their quality of life and daily activity. So the COPD X guidelines are the Australian and New Zealand evidence-based guidelines for the diagnosis and management of COPD. They are reviewed quarterly and updated online every six months. Research has shown that at least Less than 10% of GPs refer to the CFDX guidelines on a regular basis. However, because the guidelines are a bit complex, like all guidelines, Lung Foundation Australia has developed a number of clinical resources that summarise and translate these guidelines to support the busy primary care setting. The CFDX concise guidelines for primary care is a handbook on the diagnosis and management of patients with COPD. It features levels of evidence and strength of recommendation. The COPDX plan is organised around the numeric COPDX. C stands for case findings and concern diagnosis. O stands for optimising function. P stands for prevent deterioration. D is the Developing Support Network and Self-Management Plan and X is stands for Management Exacerbation. We will look at the key recommendations under each of these sections further on. To register your interest to go to the COPDX plan, go on to www.copdx.org.au, register for the extended guideline and you will also receive notification of updates the concise guide. Now, this is a one-page summary of the COPDX guidelines. It's the stepwise management of stable COPD allogram. Uh, it's a one-page snapshot of the COPDX guidelines. It shows the progression nature of the disease, highlights typical symptoms and lung function commonly 
presented at each stage. So you've got the box that says um, mild and the symptoms, as you can see, few symptoms. To moderate, you get increased dyspnea. And then to severe, you can see that they get some dyspnea on minimal exertion um, and their quality of life is reduced and they have lots of sputum and chronic cough. And also it just shows you the lung function underneath that we just discussed. And then we go on to non-pharmacological interventions and um, down there is the pharmacological intervention. So this gives you the evidence-based practice in a good quick snapshot. The resource provides a guide in the development of a care plan. It highlights where non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions should be considered at each, at each stage of the disease progression. The table on the rear of the resource shows a guide in addition to therapy. It explains which medicines can be used together and importantly, those medicines that shouldn't be used together. And that's demonstrated in this box just at the top. This is a very useful guide to um, show your patients what medications they're on and actually check in if they're on the correct medication. And also patients can use this to go and take to their GPs as well. Now a CBD um, asthma tool called CAS is designed to measure the impact of CBD on the person's life and how this changes over time. The CAT is very simple to administrate and aims to help clinicians manage patients' COPD better. The CAT is a validated, short, eight-item and simple patient-completed questionnaire developed for the use of routine clinical practice. The content of the CACA Sorry, the content of the CAT questionnaire has been derived by CABD patients and is adapted from St. George Quality Life Questionnaire. The patient should be able to understand and answer the eight questions easily. You should not need to assist patients to complete it. In fact, it's much better if they complete this independently. It is recommended that patients routinely complete the CAT questionnaire every two to three months to detect changes and trends in the CAT score. As you see, if a patient scores five to nine points, it has low impact on their quality of life. If they have 10 to 20 points, it's actually medium impact. And it gives you guidelines whether that should be a person going to pulmonary rehab or what, what interventions they should have. If, if they've got 20 points or higher, it's a high impact, and over 30 points, it's very high impact on their quality of life, and they definitely should be going to pulmonary rehab and other interventions by other health professionals. So smoking cessation, an important part, as we know, it affects people with COPD and the progression of this disease. So what works? As noted earlier, there are benefits to smoking cessation and it will help reduce the rate of lung deterioration. However, we also know that smoking cessation is very difficult to do as it is 15% worse than heroin and cocaine addiction. There are a range of smoking cessation interventions available. Here is the evidence in terms of what most effective in helping quit smoking. As you can see, Combined counselling and pharmacological, um, pharmacological therapy actually results in the highest quit rate. You can see this down here. So, if you have patients or people coming to visit you, always ask them about smoking and, then, and also, importantly, about passive smoking. Tailor the cessation advice to include gender-specific issues. For instance, a teenage woman might be worried about weight gain or wrinkles or you know, damage to their skin and consider prescribing and counselling as it is such an addictive process and they do need support to quit smoking. Call me rehab. Any patients who have symptoms with COPD, for instance, and they're breathless, would benefit from a pulmonary rehab program. 
school we rehab program is a program ran over a period of six to eight weeks and it's twice a week sessions. The program includes an exercise and education session. Education topics covers a range of areas including lung, lung disease and management of COPD, medication, managing breathlessness, exercise and physical activity, nutrition and healthy eating, stress, anxiety and depression, airway clearance, energy conservation, growing, home oxygen and, and end of life issues. Research shows that attending a pulmonary rehab program reduces symptoms such as anxiety and depression. It improves quality of life and exercise capacity, reduces disability and enhances the patient's sense of control over their condition. These programs have been shown to be cost effective and reduce hospitalisation. Lung Foundation Australia has listing on their website of where all the programs are located in Australia. For contact details, you can call the information and support line on 1800 654 301. Physical activity is for the benefit that includes items on this slide. It also can help lower your blood pressure and cholesterol. Reduce your risk of heart attack and reduce the risk of cardiovascular diseases. It minimises health-related medical costs for individuals and communities. Helps reduce levels of stress. It determines maintaining a healthy weight. It increases energy levels, confidence, and happiness. Reduces risk of anxiety and depression. It helps you sleep better. It fits in proper balance and posture and maintain a healthy bone and strength, strong muscles. It's a fun way to spend time with the family and friends and a great way to meet new people. Exercises included in pulmonary rehab programs and individual programs are paid for individuals. Lungs in Action is a community-based exercise program that follows on from the pulmonary rehabilitation program. An exercise physiologist and a physiotherapist can assist patients with exercise programs. The patient guide Better Living with CFPD has a lot of useful information on physical activity programs. Other interventions for CFPD. Healthy eating, CFPD patients are at increased risk of poor nutrition, weight loss, and reduced muscle strength. It is important to eat well to have energy for daily activity. A dietitian can assist patients to retain a healthy weight. Swallowing disorder. The coordination of breathing and swallowing may cause difficulties for some patients. To reduce the risk of food going into the lungs, patients can do numerous things, such as trying not to eat or drink when breathless eating slowly and taking small mouthfuls, sitting upright when eating or drinking, selecting food that is soft and easy to chew or add sauce or gravy to moisture food, smaller and more frequent meals, minimise taking talking during meal times, alternate between sips of fluids and solids, try swallowing twice per mouthful, and just remain upright for 30 minutes after meals. A speech pathologist can help with swallowing difficulty, and it's common in lung disease to have this issue. Airway clearance. Not everyone with CFPD will need to use airway clearance technique, as they may not experience buildup of mucus in the lungs. But those with chronic bronchitis certainly will need help. If symptoms are not cleared from the lungs, it can cause ongoing inflammation, which can lead to further lung damage. All airway clearance treatment techniques should include huffing and coughing to clear secretions. Exploratory devices, such as a bubble pet or hydro pet, can be used to help patients with airway clearance. Also, breathing techniques, such as relaxed breathing, prolonged expiratory breathing, 
and recovery positions, pacing, so you do your activity slowly and you can manage these, improve your fitness, managing anxiety. Images show, this image here shows a lady recovering on, her, on a tree. This position is a good position that will be taught by your physiotherapist and can assist in patients um, with managing to increase their exercise tolerance and also they'll teach airway clearance techniques. Fatigue management and energy conservation. The principles are you complete the task in the simplest and easiest way possible. Using energy wisely to ensure that after all essential tasks are completed, enough energy is left for leisure activities. Existing technology such can help to make tasks easier and conserve energy, as seen on these pictures. Shoehorn, for instance. An occupational therapist can help patients with fatigue management and energy conservation. Managing stress, anxiety and depression. Now, the Better Living with QPD, a patient guide, has information on all these interventions for patients. More information for health professionals is available through the COPD online and pulmonary rehabilitation training online program. So consider comorbidity. Anxiety and depression are frequently associated with chronic disease including asthma and COPD. In stable COPD, the prevalence of clinical depression ranges from 10 to 20 10 to 42 percent, and anxiety between 10 and 19 percent. In patients with more severe disease, especially oxygen-dependent patients and those recovering from a recent acute exacerbation, the rates of anxiety and depression are proportionally higher. Depression, anxiety, and COPD are underdiagnosed and often undertreated for morbidity. The presence and impact of anxiety and depression may be reliably predicted with several validated questionnaires, such as the Kessler Psychological Distress K, a scale known as the K10, Depression Anxiety Stress Scale known as DAS, and the Hospital Anxiety Depression Scale known as HAD. Osteoporosis, people with COPD, have many of the risk factors that contribute to the development of osteoporosis, such as smoking, use of oral steroids, vitamin D deficiency, low body mass index, decreased mobility as the disease progresses and advancing age, just to name just a few. Obstructive sleep apnea. The combination of COPD and obstructive sleep apnea is known as an overlap syndrome. About 20% of patients with COPD also have obstructive sleep apnea. Equal sleepiness scale has eight questions to screen if a person may have sleep apnea. Below 10, you need to talk to a doctor at lifestyle changes. Over to 10 to 16, you may be suffering from excessive daytime sleepiness. See your GP for possible causes and treatment. 16 plus, you are dangerously sleepy and it's imperative that you see your GP for treatment and referral to a speech therapist, um, to a sleep therapist. Sleep apnea therapist, sorry. Incontinence. Research has shown that pelvic floor responds to regular exercise that provides a better chance of preventing or overcoming many of the problems associated with weak floor, pelvic floor. Lung Foundation has outlined training for nurses. We discuss all these topics in more detail, including patient handouts and clinical checklists. Again, Better Living with CBD has information on comorbidities for patients. Immunisation. So annual influenza immunisation reduces the development of severe respiratory complications and hospitalisations or death from both respiratory disease and all causes by up to 50%. 
The pneumococcal immunisation is known to be highly effective in preventing invasive bacterial pneumococcal pneumonia, but may be less effective in elderly or immune suppressed patients. There is no direct evidence of its efficiency in preventing pneumococcal exacerbations of COPD. The prevention of pneumonia is in these patients. We've already reduced respiratory reserve is a worthy goal in its own right. So pneumococcal immunisation is really recommended in this group. COPD is usually a progressive disease, even with the best available care. Regular review is mandatory to assess disease progression and determine whether treatment adjustment is necessary and to check on the development of progression and complications of comorbidity. Consider vaccines such as vaccines, which is whooping cough, if they are looking after children or so. Oxygen therapy. In addition to quit smoking, domiciliary oxygen is the only other therapy known to prolong survival in severe COPD. Oxygen therapy aims to increase the baseline blood oxygen level, therefore preserving vital organ function. Hypoxemia, or low blood oxygen, is common in patients with severe COPD. Typical symptoms of hypoxemia are dyspnea, increased blood pressure, tachycardia, which is fast heart rate, restlessness, stupor or coma, hypotension, which is low blood pressure, due to increased internal cardiac output that has fallen, Ventricular fibrillation, which is faster heart rate, which is irregular, and other conditions. Long-term oxygen therapy is potentially expensive and only benefits certain patients. Patients that meet a certain criteria are usually eligible for free oxygen, and funding is only provided if the prescribing respiratory physician or respiratory nurse practitioner is an approved prescriber. To prescribe long-term oxygen, the, must, the patient must consistently have a partial arterial oxygen pressure of below 55, whilst at rest and awake. Low levels indicate hypoxia. The normal range of the PaO2 is 80 to 100. An oxygen level about 60 is adequate for most generally over 90% saturation with oxygen at this level of oxygen pressure. Pulse oximetry is a useful screening test to determine if further assessment is required. If a pulse oximetry reading is less than 90% saturation, the patient should undergo an arterial blood gas and a 6-minute walk test. Also consider if they're planning a holiday that requires being on an airplane, they may need a high altitude test to see if they're fit to fly or they have to test. Long-term oxygen therapy is prescribed medication and the prescription is made for the individual. Long-term oxygen therapy delivers the benefit to the patient if they use it for at least 16 to 18 hours a day. The flow rate of delivery of oxygen should be set at the lowest rate needed to maintain a resting PaO2, which is the oxygen level in your partial arterial pressure, of 60. A flow rate of between 0.5 to 2 litres per minute is usually sufficient for patients with COPD with an increase of 1 litre per minute during exercise. There are two main types of oxygen equipment in Australia. They are oxygen concentrators, which filter nitrogen out of the air to deliver almost pure oxygen. These are big machines that plug in people's homes. Gas cylinders, or oxygen cylinders as I call them, these come in a range of sizes. The smaller oxygen cylinders are portable, and they are light enough to be taken when leaving the house. Oxygen is usually delivered through extra soft nasal or cannulas, or they can be through masks. 
Let's talk about pharmacological interventions to manage CVD at each stage in the disease progression. Clinicians also have an important role in supporting patients to use their inhalers correctly and adhere to the medication regime. This slide is taken from a stepwise management of stable CVD and can be used as a guide of pharmacological CAPD. The table ties type of guide to additional therapy show which class of medicines can be used together and which class of medications shouldn't be used together. Again, as you can see at the top of the box. Demonstrate what they are on and what they should and shouldn't use. Please note that this version of the resource was published in August 2014 prior to the approval of a number of medicines including Increase, which is a LAMA, which is a long-acting muscarinic receptor, and then you've got your, your LAVAs and LAMAs, such as ONRO, which is a LAMA and LAVA, and BRIO, which is an inhaled corticoid and a long-acting bronchial agonist. This is a useful guide to show patients what they're taking, and just be mindful that certain drugs like um, the Atrovent inhaler shouldn't be used with the LAMAs, the long-acting muscularinic antagonists, because it's the same drug. And to be fair to GPs, in hospital it's not on their prescribing budget to prescribe something like Spireva, for instance, and they will be given Atrovent nebules and Atrovent inhaler on discharge and while they're in hospital. And in view that the GP should stop this and go back on to the spirea, but that's a common mistake that we find out in the community. So, in developing the medicine regime, it is important that patients fully inform and more specifically they understand what the medicine is for, how the medicine works and the benefits of taking it as prescribed. How long before the medica medication takes effect? How and when to administer the medicine, i.g. is it in the morning or at night? It is good to explain that your therapy, for instance, is a 12-hour therapy, so that means you need to take it twice a day to cover you 24 hours. Patients understand that when you explain it in that way. How long the effects of the medicine last and how often they must take the medicine, or how long they must Take medicines such like short courses if it's um, an antibiotic therapy for an exacerbation, for instance. What are the possible side effects of the medicines are and how to limit or avoid side effects? For example, long-term use of oral steroids increase the risk of osteoporosis. If the medicines will interact with each other, also is important with other comorbidities. slide just to reinforce that. I'll just give you a few minutes on that. Okay, so managing exacerbations. A history of previous exacerbations may be the strongest predictor of future exacerbation and possible decline. Patients who have frequent exacerbation of CFD have higher mortality, poorer quality of life, increased airway inflammation and more rapid declining lung function compared to those who have less frequent exacerbation as shown on this disease structure of patients with COPD. The more rapid declining lung function compared to those who have less frequent exacerbation actually results in a cluster of exacerbation and um, a higher risk of the second one and the third one. So it's important to give this detrimental effect recurrent exacerbation path on outcomes of people with COPD. An acute exacerbation of COPD may require hospital admission for management of respiratory failure. More than half of these patients re will re-admit to hospital within 12 months. Studies have shown that about 10% of patients with primary diagnosis of COPD will die during or within 12 months of admission, 
and that the median survival for the first emission is around five years in men and eight years in women. Here are the action plans. It is important to regularly review a CABD action plan with your patient so that they monitor their symptoms and know how and when to start additional medications. The implication of CABD action plans show that early treatment can prevent reduced exacerbation. In how dilators are effective in relieving increasing symptoms. Systematic cause of steroids reduce the severity of exacerbation and shorten recovery. Exacerbation through clinical signs of infection, such as increased volume, change in colour of sputum or and fever, benefit from antibiotic therapy. Control oxygen therapy is indicated for hypoxemia. Patient can benefit from a written action plan. The aim for the action plan is to help patients recognise the signs of exacerbation, which is actually seen in this is when you're well, it's the green box, and your regular medication, and the orange is when you're starting to become unwell, and it gives you signs of symptoms there, and what to increase. And then the emergency treatment key would be antibiotics and duprednisone. So the patient needs to understand when to start the prednisone or antibiotics. There is an indigenous action plan available on the Lung Foundation website, which is tailored for indigenous people. So there is a presentation, it's really a broad brush overview of the diagnosis and management of COPD. To gain an in-depth understanding, it is recommended that you consider undertaking some additional training. Lung Foundation Australia have a number of online training courses for nurses, pharmacists and allied health professionals. More information about these can be found on the training page on their website. In addition to the COPD training program, a training program on heart failure is offered to health professionals that exercise, that exercise patients with heart failure. These modules are offered separately but have been developed as part of Lungs in Action Training Program. And the resources available are many on the Lung Foundation website. And it's very, very valuable to get on to the website for this, especially the um, Better Living with COVID. Um, and it gives you little individual chapters, which is that one there, um, the patient guide. It gives you a little bit in individual chapters that you can download. So if you're doing nutrition, you can print off the nutrition part. And it's very useful in rehab programs also. There is also Better Living with Lung Disease, which is a DVD that you can actually loan to patients to um, understand their lung health as well. And also useful health professionals. So there is the um, COPE or CBD Online Patient Education Program. We really recommend our patients to um, learn a bit more and take time about learning their lung health. That's available on the Lung Foundation. And also the support groups are, are amazing for people with lung disease that they can support each other and learn a bit more about the health. There's educational seminars that Lung Foundation organises. And there's telephone support groups, online forums, training in self-management, and of course, lungs in action. So that concludes today's presentation.